Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm Scott Miller and I serve as your host and interviewer each week. This week, I'm delighted to have Janice Kaplan as our guest, the author of the new book out today, The Genius of Women, the former editor of Parade Magazine, the author of 15 books, including multiple New York Times bestsellers, one you probably heard of out recently called The Gratitude Diaries. Janice Kaplan, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks, Scott. It's such a pleasure to be here. Hey, delighted to have you. The book is out today. It's in hardcover. I was honored enough to have an advanced co copy and soft cover, uh, as is my nature. I read the entire book, The Genius of Women. Delighted to have you here today and kind of get into uh, some of the passion that you've uh, brought to the book from your, your lifelong career and your research. Before we actually get into the book, Janice, would you kind of acclimate our audience, our listeners and viewers to your career, some of the books that you've written, and perhaps why you chose to write this, your 15th book, about the genius of a woman. Well, thanks, Scott. You know, I've spent much of my career going back and forth between being a television producer and a magazine editor. As you said, I was the editor of Parade and uh, and a writer. And many of my books have been novels um, over the years. And then I, after I left Parade, I switched to nonfiction. And I have been very passionate about the books that I write. And this one in particular, The Genius of Women, is a subject that has just intrigued me from the start. In fact, way back when, when I first graduated college, when I graduated Yale, I had a fellowship from Yale to write my very first book. And that book was called Women in Sports. So in many ways, this is a subject that has intrigued me and interested me for, uh, for much of my life. Well, the research in the book is phenomenal and it's extraordinarily well documented and researched. I found it captivating. As a guy, I had to put it down sometime and kind of like not carry all the sins of my forefathers. But I also found it to be very insightful around how I'm helping to be part of the solution or the problem, right? Including the women that are in my life. I'm the father of three young boys, five, seven, and nine. But that doesn't... Um, inhibit my ability to teach them how they can also be motivators behind genius regardless of gender. You have some fascinating interviews in the book and a couple of great quotes from people that you interviewed. So I'd like to start in the beginning of the book where I believe it was Janice, one of your interviewees said that genius is where extraordinary ability meets celebrity. Will you expand on that? Yes, that was a wonderful professor from Cambridge University who I met way at the beginning of my research. And we were having lunch together and I asked him about genius and he sort of pondered and in his plumy English accent, which I won't try to imitate, said exactly what you just said, that genius is where extraordinary ability meets celebrity. And I was sort of taken aback because this was a very uh, academic sort. He's a professor at Cambridge, as I said, he did not mean celebrity in a Kardashian sort of way. I am sure this is a gentleman who has never heard or watched reality television. But what he meant by celebrity is getting your work noticed, getting your work seen. And whether you're in academia or whether you're working in, in a company, you know that you can have a brilliant idea. And if nobody's paying attention to it, it really doesn't matter very much. And for so much of history, and quite frankly, up to this very moment, women have indeed often had the extraordinary ability, but they haven't had that notice. They haven't had their work seen and recognized. The other thing I discovered both from this professor and from others is that there's another element to genius, which is that genius needs to be nurtured. And I think we make a mistake when we think of genius as just being something that springs up full form, you know, that either you are or you aren't. And I had a rather broad definition of genius as I was doing this book. I was thinking of it just as people who are really smart and people who are really interesting and people who are really successful and talented at what they do. And what I discovered over and over again was that talent, that core of knowledge and understanding needs to be nurtured, whether it's one person, parent, teacher, leader in the company, CEO, somebody who sees you, who recognizes you, and tries to make sure that what you have can develop. Janice, I feel like I earned an honorary humanities degree in reading your book because you exposed me to so many um, artists and, and sculptors and geniuses, of regardless of gender, 
throughout the book, some hidden and some not. I love this quote also, that you need access to be a genius. I mean, in many ways, that's kind of one of the premises of your book, is that the reason why such a wildly disproportionate of humans that we now think of as geniuses are men, because they had access that most women didn't have 200, 500, 1,000 years ago. Talk a bit about the role that access plays in how men might have dominated this uh, colloquial phrase of being a genius. Well, I think it's two parts there. One is indeed the access and the very ability to be able to practice your craft, whether it's art or writing or science. And on the other, as we said, is it getting noticed? Because one of the things that surprised me so much is that I discovered women from the past who I personally had never heard of. Right. And I'm pretty good on these, on these subjects and on, on women's topics, but I didn't know about some of the women genius painters of the Renaissance. Um, we all know Michelangelo, but we sure don't know some of the other names of the great women painters. Um, and the same thing in the, in the Golden Age. We all know Rembrandt, but do we know Judith Leister? Probably not. And what was interesting to me is that with so many of them, they actually were quite famous in their time. Mm -hmm. And then they got written out of history. And Scott, you, you mentioned before that you have three sons and that you, uh, you were kind enough to read every page of the book, and I appreciate that. And, and the book is not an angry book, and I hope you found it that way. No, yeah. um, it's a book that, that recognizes these as issues that have gone on. And certainly there was no reason for men who were in power to want to give up their power. We all understand that. And one of the things I think that has happened is that we're starting to look at things differently now. I was really excited to come across a woman painter again named Clara Peters, who I had certainly never heard of. And I don't think most of us had heard of. She again uh, was a Dutch painter at the, at the time of Rembrandt. And uh, then the Prado Museum in Madrid a few years ago gave her a solo show. All of a sudden, Clara Peters was a huge star. And um, I happened to be in Madrid at one point as I was working on this book and I did go and there, they still have several of her paintings up. But it also sort of surprised me to wonder well, th this excitement about Clara Peters now is wonderful and how fabulous to be rediscovering somebody like that. But it also gives you pause, doesn't it? Because if her work was brilliant now, it was also brilliant for the last 400 years. And why didn't we know that then? Why are we only seeing it now? And that's true for so many, many other women uh, throughout history. We like to think that that's changed. We like to think that we are all pretty aware now that we're giving men and women the same opportunities. But um, I walk through the Metropolitan Museum of, of uh, Art in New York, where I live, just a week or so ago, and um, I did not come across too many women artists. I had to look really, really hard. And just one other quick story on that, which is that studies have shown that if you show people works of art, there is no way that they know whether the piece is by a woman or by a man. But as soon as you tell them that it's by a woman, they like it less. So we have these deep unconscious ways of judging things that really have very little to do with talent or genius or ability. Janice, like you, I've offered a, a few books, not 15, maybe someday. And when I go give a keynote speech, I'll have people often say, Scott, I feel like I know you after having read your book, because my books are very personal. And I feel like I know you, having read uh, The Genius of Women. But I also feel like I know your husband, because you share uh, some stories about your husband. One in particular I thought was quite provocative. And it kind of centered around you and your husband uh, coming to the realization in your own art collection in your apartment in New York, I think it was in New York, where you realized there were vastly more male artists than female artists, and you kind of took it a couple steps further into the art gallery scene. Would you kind of recreate as much of that, because I found that very insightful in my own relationship with my wife around how we make decisions and how we're unconsciously biased or consciously biased in what we collect and like and such. It's a great story. Well, thanks. Um, yes, and my dear husband has been a part of so many of my books. I think people who read The Gratitude Diaries know him as the handsome husband. And in this book, he pointed out that he seems to be the one who's always calming me down uh, in this book when I get upset about something. And, and he does play that role, too. 
but we do have some nice art in, in our apartment in Manhattan, uh, mostly lithographs, which is what we can afford. Um, but we've collected for a very long time. And so we do have some, some great artists, mostly from the mid 20th century. And as I was writing this book, I started walking around our apartment and counting the number of women artists that we have. And um, I went to him that night and I forget the percentage now, but I think I said, you know, we only have 13% women. We have to do something about that. And he said, well, uh, we don't collect by gender. We collect by what we like. And as I just mentioned before, we all think that and we don't realize how deeply affected we are. So we did go to a local art gallery where we often buy things and we're actually, it's a woman who runs the gallery. And we talked to her uh, about that question because looking around her gallery, there was almost no art by women there. And she was so aware of this subject and I asked her how it could be that she didn't have more art by women. And she pointed out that, of course, she was driven by the demands of the market. And in the marketplace, again, consciously or probably much more unconsciously, people simply assume that men's art is going to be worth more than women's. So they will pay more. And um, again, as we're starting to become more and more aware of women artists, their prices are going up. I think a piece by Joan Mitchell, who's an abstract expressionist, her work recently sold for about $16 million. But that doesn't really compare to the hundreds of millions of dollars that some of the people who, who uh, are her contemporaries uh, work sells for. So the demands of the market become an unconscious part of how we value something also. If I tell you that a piece sold for $100,000, you think of it in one way. If I tell you it have sold for $10 million, you think of it in a different way. And women have often been the victims of that problem too. It's a great story. It made me think a lot about my own um, subconscious or unconscious biases as well. The first half of the book is really a bit of um, uh, a tome through female geniuses that aren't common to the common person. And then you did lots of research I mentioned in interviews with people. You actually uh, highlight Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg more recently. And the interview you did with the famous actress Mayim Bialik from the very famous um, uh, comedian, comedian program called um, uh, Big Bang out. Theory. Say it again. The Big Bang Theory. Thank you, The Big Bang Theory. I've watched every episode. I couldn't think of the name. And she, of course, you know, plays this sort of nerdy scientist. Talk a bit about what you learned from that interview. As most of us know, she was a very famous actress in, I think, the 80s for a, a, a sitcom called Blossom. Then she, she kind of disappeared from the scene and kind of roared back on the last five or six years ago. Talk about what you learned from your interview with um, Mayim Bialik. Right. Well, Mayim was a lot of fun to talk to, as were so many of the women I spoke to. And Mayim is so interesting because she was indeed um, a star of Blossom as a child star. And then she left acting and she got a PhD in neuroscience um, and, and just became absolutely fascinated with that. And uh, as she joked, her health insurance was running out. And so she thought she had to go back to acting so that she could have some health insurance. And she was up for the job at the Big Bang Theory. And she was filling out her resume. And she didn't know where to put PhD in neuroscience. Uh, so she put it under other, mm -hmm. figuring that in Hollywood lingo, being a PhD in neuroscience was about as important as, you know, can rollerblade. Um, and apparently when the producers looked at that, they assumed that it was a joke since she was applying to for a role, auditioning for a role of a, uh, of a brilliant scientist. Um, but no, she told them that indeed it was true. And in fact, they changed the uh, uh, kind of scientist that the character was to be the same one that, that she was. She said that she thought it was so that she could correct any mistakes that they might have made. But we had an interesting conversation about the characters in the Big Bang Theory, because of course she was Amy, who was the love interest and eventually at the end of the show, the wife of Sheldon, the, the wonderful nerdy uh, physicist on the show. And the other starring woman was Kaylee Cuoco, who played Penny, the beautiful blonde. And it was very interesting to talk to Mayim about how you balance both of those and how 
she wanted girls to be able to see that they really had many, many choices in life and that there were many ways to look at what a girl can be. And that there was another character on the show who was also a scientist and my said, yeah, and she got to wear the cute clothes and have the pretty hairdos. So I think that while the show was a comedy and it was fun and it was the silly sitcom in some ways, it also had a very important message to both boys and girls to say, hey, look, there are all sorts of different kinds of people out there, and that's okay. And I bet that there are lots of really nerdy science boys who loved that show and got to suddenly see themselves as heroes too, um, just as the uh, the young women, young girls who got to watch Amy as being a, a big star uh, got to see a, a possibility for themselves that perhaps they hadn't previously foreseen. Janice, I'll bet decades from now, we'll look back on some pivot points in our generation and truly appreciate the role that Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling had on literacy, right? And, and, and the future generation of readers that glommed onto reading because of Harry Potter. I'll bet the same with the Big Bang Theory, that the number of women interested in the sciences and such will increase because of that. what that program did, how it raised up this idea that you promote in the book which is that uh, we're unconsciously absorbing messages about our value all the time. And there's no question that young girls that are watching the Big Bang Theory see two very uh, smart, capable women, one in a more voluptuous role, one in a more kind of nerdy role, to use your term as well. Talk to us about the impact of these unconscious messages that we all absorb, regardless of gender, and how do we become more aware of them to determine whether the impact is positive or negative in our lives. Well, the impact from pop culture, I think, is so much stronger than we ever realize. And the images that we see in TV do determine, especially for young kids, who we think we can be. And um, if the only geniuses you've ever seen or heard of are, you know, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. House on that series and Albert Einstein in your textbook, and you don't have an image of what a woman can be as a smart, interesting and talented person rather than just um, uh, you know, a, a pretty figure uh, on, on the sidelines. One of my great uh, issues that, that I have, a, a show that bothered me so enormously for many years was Disney's hugely successful show, The Little Mermaid. And I talk in the book about remembering the first time that I saw that movie and storming out. Um, now, in case you don't remember in that movie, um, Ariel is the little mermaid, and she's a beautiful red-headed mermaid who wants to get the kiss of true love from the prince. And the way she ends up doing it is giving up her voice so that she can't talk, and she can only woo him with how she looks. Well, what kind of message is that to give a girl? That to, to be happy in life, to get the dreams that you want in life, don't talk. How much more do we need to tell girls just shut up and look pretty? And um, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a lot of fun to go to the movies with sometimes, I'm afraid, because I see those messages and I see how potent they are. And when I see little girls walking around holding their REL dolls, um, even when they're wearing their girl power t-shirts with it, I realize how problematic that is and how difficult it is. Disney is doing a remake of that movie now, and um, they uh, have a, a wonderful young actress as the lead who is ethnically diverse, and so that's wonderfully exciting, and cheers and bravo to Disney for doing that. And I certainly hope that they can wipe out some of the misogyny that's in that story also. Um, one, one other story about kids like that, Scott, if you don't mind, there was some wonderful research that was done by two researchers, one named Sarah Jane Leslie at Princeton and the other Andre Simpion at NYU. And they got little kids together, kids the age of, of your children, and um, they told them a story about a very, very smart person. They didn't say who that person was. And then they showed them four pictures, two of them of a woman and two of them of men. And they asked the children, who is the very, very smart person from this story? Well, up until the age of five, the children picked the person who looked most like them. So the boys picked one of the men and the girls picked one of the women. But then at age six, it suddenly changed. And the boys all picked one of the men 
and so did the girls. And um, Sarah Jane Leslie and Andre Simpion said they weren't completely sure why that change happened so dramatically at age six, but it did. And what they thought was happening was that the messages from society were so strong and had so infiltrated the children by that point that anything else just wasn't, wasn't nearly as important, including the fact that, by the way, at age six, most of the time, girls are doing better in school than boys are. But they even that message isn't as powerful as the one that they're getting from all sides in the society in very, very subtle ways sometimes. And by the way, sometimes a problem with social science research as you know, Scott, is that it's very hard to replicate. Well, I have seen this study replicated any number of times, unfortunately, with the same results each time. And by the way, you could probably try it in your living room, get a bunch of your, your children's friends together and uh, see if you don't get the same results. Well, we see those reinforcements in so many different parts of our life. It reminds me, as you were talking, about the Super Bowl halftime show just a few weeks ago, right, with Shakira and Jennifer Lopez. It was a great show. And the pole dancing and the gyrating, the costumes. I mean, my wife and I found ourselves having to explain to our three young boys kind of what was going on. And, and my five-year-old started using the word sexy a lot. And my wife and I, not uncomfortable, we were just kind of, kind of horrified at how do we uh, digest what happened. And it was entertaining for adults and Probably not very family wholesome, but I think it's not just men, is it, that perpetuate these stereotypes, it's also women for that matter. Right, and I'm glad you brought that up because I also watched the Super Bowl show and I said that sometimes I'm not a lot of fun at movies. I guess I'm not a lot of fun with TV either. I was horrified. I was appalled. I thought, you know, Jennifer Lopez is a woman who has done so much for women's empowerment and has stood for so much for women's empowerment. And this is how she wants to present a woman to this huge audience. Um, but that's exactly the kind of messaging that we're talking about. And your children see that and little girls and everywhere see that. And they assume that that is what a woman is supposed to be. And that's all she's supposed to be. And I think it's, um, I, I think it's, it's, shocking and i'm not looking to censor anything but we so desperately need those other images on the other side um every child shouldn't have to stand up for herself and be the one to say you know no this is wrong i don't want to do that they're too little to understand that and every adult my age or your age shouldn't have to do that either uh, we should have enough other images out there uh, that, that can help us along yeah for the record big j-lo fan big shakir fan but i was left perplexed was I in a strip club or was I, well, I'd never been, or was I watching <laughs> Super Bowl halftime show? Because it was, you know, it was, um, it was interesting. Okay, so in the midst of this book, you did a ton of research around the neurology of the brain. You don't claim to be a neuroscientist, but you learned about some of the, uh, the more recent research around the differences between male and female brains, and you debunked a couple of things. What would you like all of our listeners and audiences to know around what we've led to be leave is true about the brain, but in fact, maybe isn't exactly right. Well, we tend to think that there are indeed, as you said, male and female brains. And most of the new research in neuroscience says that is simply not true. Um, that the overlap between the brains is so much, so dramatic. And, and there's one professor who described brains as being a mosaic. Yeah. Um, I think her name is Daphne Joel. She's at Tel Aviv University. And, and she said she couldn't find a single brain uh, of all that she researched that was all male or all female. They're all a composite of different traits. And I think it's such a mistake when we try to assume that people are hardwired in a certain way. I spoke to a wonderful neuroscientist named Lise Elliott out of Chicago. And um, she just gets outraged when people talk about things being hardwired. And she said, nothing in the brain is hardwired above the, 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 the brain stem, which is the place that uh, is for all of our you know, basic, base, very basic functions. Um, babies are born and they're kind of a mass of neurons that are unconnected connected and uh, and we connect them in those in those first years and I do hear over and over again parents telling me oh no I haven't done anything differently with my son and daughter but they just behave differently um, but I don't think we're aware of how dramatically 
we do influence them. You know, I, I give the example in the book of if I told you that language was hardwired and my proof was that at age one or two, some children speak French and some children speak German and some children speak English. And so that's just proof that it's hardwired in the brain what language they're going to speak. You would laugh at me. You would say, no, 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 that's not how it works. They learn from hearing it around them. They pick it up. Children are these great statistical processors. They pick up everything in the environment. They learn things that way. Um, well, why do we think that it's easier to learn a language than it is to learn whether you're supposed to like Legos or Barbie dolls? Um, children are also picking those things up from the environment. And um, the again, the evidence on the neuroscience of the brain suggests very strongly that whatever little differences there may be, um, and there certainly may be, are so completely irrelevant when compared to the much, much greater social issues yeah. that there are. I think there's also a big danger, Scott, in our believing that there is a difference in how boys and girls um, are wired, as it were, because we then in many school systems are starting to separate boys and girls and starting to teach them differently. And again, think how ridiculous that is. All of us are on some kind of a bell curve, right? That some of us are good at, very good at something, most of us are in the middle and some are at the, at the far end. And, and that's true for boys and girls in all subjects. And if you just assume that, let's say, um, boys are better in math and girls are better in poetry. And so you separate the children out so that they can learn that way. What about that girl who's great in math? And what about that boy who's great in poetry? You're just losing so much potential. And as one professor, a wonderful professor of African-American studies at um, Emory University named Carol Anderson said to me, um, she said, you don't create a great country by cutting off potential. And you don't create a great company. You don't create a great academy by doing that either. And um, I think the problem often starts with that belief of a difference in brain, which really is so minimal and so unimportant. Janice, thank you for sharing that. In our final few moments, I'd like you to think about who's watching and listening to today's podcast. I mentioned this is the largest in the world podcast dedicated to the topic of leadership. Uh, chief learning officers, EVPs of human resources, lots of business unit leaders around the world listening and watching today's conversation. What do you hope specifically that the, the female listener, the female leader takes away from your book? What, 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 what should she do to be a better transition figure in the lives of people in her organization and throughout her life as a result of reading your book? Well, I think many people who are on their way up um, really need a bit of blinders to bias. They need to put aside some of the problems and focus on where they want to get. Those people who reach those leadership positions um, often look back and realize how much they had to deal with. And I think it is beholden on them to try to pave the way, to try to help other women and to, um, to recognize individual potential. And whether you're a male leader or a female leader, it's really, really hard to understand your own unconscious bias, to understand your own implicit expectations of people. But I think once you stop, once you're willing to say, yeah, I guess I probably do have biases that I don't recognize that are deeply ingrained in me, and I'm gonna try to get over them. I'm gonna try to look at people as individuals. Um, I think that's a really important first step. I think it's also really important for men and women to spend time together as colleagues, uh, to know each other as, as individuals, to know each other as friends, to work together as colleagues. And um, leaders can certainly make that happen um, in both formal and informal ways. Janice, this might violate what you just said, but what advice would you give to, to male leaders and readers? I mean, I, I am that, right? Uh, to, to quote you, I'm a dog lover, and I'm white, and I'm a male, and I often see things through that lens. What advice, what, uh, what hope would you give to, to male leaders and readers of your book that, that of what they can do differently? I'll use the same phrase, to be a transition figure in the lives of their daughters, of their sons, of those people working with and for them in their organization. What can That's men do point. differently to give access to women to help everyone see their genius? 
Well, it's, it, it is a great question. And um, I think you answered it there by saying give access to everyone so that you can see their genius. Um, and I think it's very much recognizing people as individuals. One of the big mistakes I think that men in particular do, but probably all of us do, is to lump people together and to label people. Uh, one of the wonderful genius women I spoke to is a Broadway director named Tina Landau. And Tina said that she doesn't like to be called a woman director. She likes to be called a woman who directs. And it seems like a subtle difference, but it's really important because she is a woman and she is a director. They have nothing to do with each other. How she directs is how Tina Landau directs. It's not how a woman directs. And I think as male leaders, it's so important to understand that, to not lump women together in one category. I think uh, in trying to give a positive spin now, we hear a lot of men saying, well, women are more collegial and, and they work together. And because they don't look for the spotlight, they're, they're better at team players. Well, that's lovely, and that's a very nice way to look at it, but you know what? It's as silly a stereotype as any other. Some women are collegial, some women aren't. Some women work well together, and some don't. So look at people as individuals. Try to get rid of the idea of what a male leader does or what a woman leader does, and think just what a good leader does. Janice, last question. I want to I want to go a little further because you, you just – reminded me of a part of the book. We talked about some of the now kind of outrageous comments that Larry Summers made back when he was the president of Harvard. I believe he was replaced, if not immediately, ultimately by a woman. And when she came in, she, I forgot her name, you'll remember it. She said, I'm not Harvard's female president, I'm Harvard's president, right? She kind of made that declaration. Right. And um, another uh, Ivy League president to who I interviewed, Shirley Tillman, who was the first woman president of Princeton, and to date the only woman president of Princeton, uh, was also a great microbiologist, is a great microbiologist, and said that when she was young, she used to try to close her eyes and envision a scientist. And when she could envision a woman as often as she could envision a man, she knew she was doing okay. And when Shirley came in, because she had that background, she brought in so many women in very top positions. And quite frankly, the university wasn't excited about that. The students really questioned whether this was affirmative action. And their answer came when these women turned out to be so extraordinary that three of them are now themselves university mm -hmm. presidents. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great, a great trick Try to close your eyes and think of think of uh, a scientist, a leader, a painter, and when you can see a woman as often as you can see a man, you know you're on the right track. Jana, it's such an honor having you today. Your next bestseller, The Genius of Women. This book is going to be a great read in businesses, at book clubs. My wife has already gotten dibs on one of the galley copies, so I'll take it back home for her nightstand tonight. Thank you for joining us on Leadership. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to be with you, Scott. Great success to you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. If you're not subscribing, visit franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership tab. Fill out the form. It's complimentary. Comes out every Tuesday via email. And we push the podcast to every podcast platform, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher. Rate it, rank it, review it. And we'll see you back here next week for another fantastic guest. Thanks for joining us.